The situation in the modern Midwest was a lot more complicated in 1832 than what it is today. For one thing, large areas of territory were purely for the Indians to have. The area in brown on the left is what the Sac and the Fox would have in modern-day Iowa. The area in blue shows the territory that was open for settlement in either U.S. states or U.S. territories like Michigan Territory. Note only a small portion of modern-day Wisconsin was open to settlement, while most of Illinois was open to settlers. As Black Hawk and his British band moved up the Rock River, they tried to connect and contact other native groups in the area seeking an alliance. Their first probable contact was the Winnebago, especially those who lived along the Rock River in Wisconsin and Illinois. They had intermarried with the Sauk and would most likely want to be allied with them. However, there were other Winnebago, those who lived along the Wisconsin and Mississippi rivers. They were more connected by trade and relation to the Sioux or Dakota Indians shown in yellow. Yet while Black Hawk moved up the Rock River, he was disappointed with any offers of help from the Winnebago. So instead, he turned to the other native power in the region, the Potawatomi. They hold a vast area of territory in both Illinois and Wisconsin, and also had the freedom to travel anywhere they wished in the rest of Illinois for hunting or trading. So on May 1st, in response to Black Hawk's request to meet with him, a delegation of Potawatomi arrive at Black Hawk's camp near the Rock and Kishwaukee rivers. In the presence of the British band, Black Hawk begins by asking for supplies as he was running out of food. This open-air council does not go well. After receiving no positive responses to his requests, Black Hawk calls a Potawatomi delegation to his lodge to speak with them privately. Already knowing the answer, Black Hawk inquires if there has been news of British assistance. The negative response from the Potawatomi dashed the last thread of hope Black Hawk has of fighting the Americans with powerful British support. Yet not willing to give up on the Potawatomi alliance, he sends the delegation back with instructions to bring their chiefs back to his camp for another talk. During the next two weeks, emissaries from the British band travel to Potawatomi villages, deceptively declaring that the Winnebagos have already joined their cause. They manage to get some attention. The Potawatomi must decide who they will back in the coming fight. General Henry Atkinson, frustrated in his attempts to find a diplomatic solution by ordering Black Hawk back across the Mississippi, turns to military force as the only means he has left to enforce the treaties broken by the British band. Atkinson realizes his regular army units are too small and musters into federal service 600 mounted volunteers and 200 volunteer infantry at Fort Armstrong. He gives Colonel Zachary Taylor command of some 340 U.S. regular infantry. Illinois Governor John Reynolds appoints Samuel Whitsides as Brigadier General to command the Illinois Volunteers. On May 9th, Sauk Indians searching for gunpowder raid the cabin of Stephen Mack and his Winnebago wife, Honaga, on the Rock River at the mouth of Dry Run Creek. Mack is able to hide the powder but couldn't save his cabin. The British band warriors burn the trading post but local Winnebago Indians intervene and Mack's life is spared. He and his wife immediately leave for Chicago. This is the first overt violent act since the British band crossed the Mississippi over a month before. The next day, unsure of Black Hawk's position and intentions, Atkinson orders his army to march up the Rock River from Fort Armstrong. Brigadier General Whitsides leads the mounted volunteers overland while the regulars with Atkinson are transported up the flooded Rock River in five Mackinac boats and two supply-laden keel boats. Woodside's troops enter the Prophet's abandoned village and burn it to the ground. At the same time, but to the north, Henry Dodge departs at the head of a party of 27 mountain men, including his two sons, Henry and Augustus Caesar Dodge, to ascertain the movements of Black Hawk and his followers. While armies are on the march, settlers across the Mineral District take action to defend themselves. Often no more than a few dozen men band together with their families and construct fortifications. Some are only fortified cabins, but many have blockhouses, palisades, trenches, and parapets that can truly be called forts. 
As fear of attack spreads, the entire population of northern Illinois and the Mineral District flee to the protection of the forts. Many of these forts will serve as protected supply bases for the armies on the march. Some will be required to block the bodies of their builders from enemies' bullets. For many settlers, the local fort and militia was the only protection for miles around. Southwestern Wisconsin and northern Illinois was sparsely populated as one local account states. At the time of the Black Hawk War, all the north part of the state was an unbroken wilderness, except for a few trading posts in the mining settlement about Galena. The country was in the possession of the Indians, had not been surveyed by the government, nor explored to any great extent by the hunter or early pioneer. One of the many dozens of settlers' forts constructed is the Blue Mounds Fort at the northeast corner of the Mineral District. Here on May 10th, Ebenezer Brigham organized a company of militia and began to construct a fort of two blockhouses and a palisade. Although hundreds of miles away from the British band, this fort would play a vital role in the coming conflict. As the militia marched up the Rock River and gathered at Dixon's Ferry, two prominent Potawatomi chiefs, Shabena and Wabansee, respond to Black Hawk's call for a council. As recorded in the Memories of Shabana, when they arrive at Black Hawk's camp, they are warmly welcomed. After serving a dog feast, Black Hawk told his friends the story of his misfortune, how he had been robbed of his home and driven away from the village he loved so well. According to one source, Black Hawk broke down in tears and wept over his lost home, and warned the two chiefs that the same would happen to them. Black Hawk then urged them to recall how they had all successfully fought against the Americans alongside the British in the War of 1812. Black Hawk argued that from a position of strength, the United Tribes would have solid bargaining power with the Americans. Shabana, however, replies that he could not join him in a war against the Whites, that Governor Clark and General Cass had made him many presents, some of which he still retains as a token of friendship and while possessions of these gifts, he cannot think of raising the tomahawk against their people. During this interview, Obunzi sits nearby smoking a pipe, taking no part in the conversation, but on finding Shabana so decided in the matter, he too refuses to take part in the contemplated war. Yet Obunzi agrees to attend the Council of Chiefs, but Shabana said he would not be present, and after advising Black Hawk to return west of the Mississippi as the only means of saving his people, the two chiefs part never to meet again. Many Potawatomi wish to ally with the Sauk and Fox. Others decide to avoid the conflict they know is coming. Chief Shabana dominates the council and argues for a peaceful resolution. After long deliberation, the Potawatomi council decides to declare passive friendship with the Black Hawk group, but declares that should any Potawatomi join Black Hawk's band, they will be regarded as traitors. Yet sympathy for Black Hawk compels some Potawatomi to leave and assist him. Just as the dog feast for the Potawatomi is ending, Black Hawk hears news that American soldiers are several miles away and slowly making their way to his position. As General Whitside's brigade march up the Rock River, they see the campsites of the British band and bring in any Indian, whether Sauk or Potawatomi, they could catch for questioning. According to the questionable source, Memories of Shabana, Shabana himself was attacked and captured by the militia and abused before others came to his rescue. By May 12th, Whitside's brigade arrived at Dixon's Ferry, where Major Isaiah Stillman had a command of 275 men. Although Whitside's was given command of the Illinois militia, he couldn't count on the commander's willingness to follow his orders. Eyewitness John Wakefield states, Major Stillman considered that he had a kind of independent corps and did not wish to be attached to General Whitside's brigade. He, the Major, on the next morning made a request of Governor Reynolds that he might be permitted to take his corps and go out as a scouting party and see if possible whether any discoveries could be made as to the situation of the enemy. Major Stillman's and Major Bailey's men were said to be eager to fight and Governor John Reynolds, eager for a quick resolution of the conflict, urged General Whitsides to issue the following order. The troops under the command of Major Stillman, including the battalion of said Major Stillman and Major Bailey, will forthwith proceed with four days' rations to the head of Old Man's Creek, where it is supposed the hostile Sac Indians are assembled, for the purpose of taking all cautious measures to coerce said Indians into submission and report themselves to this department as soon thereafter as practicable. 
John Wakefield, although not part of Stillman's brigade, was a soldier in the militia at Dixon's Ferry and could well enough comment on Stillman's movements and on the flawed command structure. The battalions had no connection with each other whatsoever before their meeting on the march to Dixon's Ferry. There they received orders to march before they were organized into a regiment, each battalion being independent of the other, commanded by its own officers, and three of those claiming the command of both, and perhaps with equal justice. In the result, however, the command for that expedition was conferred on Major Stillman, the choice of officers to refer to the men of their unit. To the militia and frontier inhabitants of Illinois, the governor's action seemed to be a reasoned and restrained response to the settlers. Wakefield states, It could not be done in any other way than a resort to arms, as all other means were tried both by General Clark and the different Indian agents, and that with a great degree of forbearance on the part of the general government, which the observer will plainly see when he takes the full view of the many outrages and depredations committed by those lawless savages who did everything except murder before there was a call for men to volunteer in defense of their country. What happened on fateful May 14th is still shrouded in mystery and controversy today as much as it was in 1832. The simple facts are Black Hawk's attempt to talk to the Americans are not clearly understood. Both sides are suspicious of each other's intentions. The Americans especially suspect treachery and ambush. While Black Hawk's men are still in the American camp, another group of Sauk warriors are attacked and chased back to Black Hawk's camp. After defending his position with only 40 men, Black Hawk sends a portion of them after the Americans and pushes them back into their own camp. Panic takes over as the Americans fear being surrounded by the entire British band. A retreat instantly turns into a rout. There is bravery shown by some on both sides, but the so-called battle is an enormous victory and morale boost for Black Hawk, and would immediately affect the entire region. The many details and varying accounts are too much to include in this overview episode, but if you want to know more about Stillman's run, check out our episode focused on the first real battle of the war. The day after the battle, Governor Reynolds issues a call for 2,000 more men. His desire and push for a quick conclusion of hostilities has backfired. General Whitsides then advances to the massacre site near Old Man Creek. Reportedly, Captain Abraham Lincoln's company of Sangamon County Mounted Militia is detailed to bury 11 of the dead of Stillman's command. The soldiers find the dead mutilated, some with their heads cut off and their skin peeled. If uncertain before, now there is no doubt for both the Indians and Americans. Blood has been spilt and the frontier is in the state of war. Stillman's run caused many to lose trust in the militia's ability to fight a war. Today, the Americans' graves are clearly marked and a monument to them and to Abraham Lincoln's involvement in their burial stands in the small town of Stillman's Valley. As news of the battle spread throughout the frontier in the days afterward, panic caused many areas to be abandoned. Settlers either travel as far away as they can from the danger, or seek protection in the forts. Yet tales of cowardice are not the only stories told in the days following Stillman's run. One of the heroes who emerges is Shabana, the Potawatomi chief. For a long time he had considered himself the friend of the white man. At great personal risk, he sends word of likely Indian trouble to the settlements. He sends his own sons and nephew to warn the Fox River and Holderman Grove settlements, while he himself warns the settlements at Vero Creek and Indian Creek. For the rest of the month, it seems as if each day brings news of a new attack. On May 19th, Sergeant Fred Stahl and five other men ride between Galena and Dixon's Ferry, bearing dispatches for General Atkinson. They are ambushed at the edge of Buffalo Grove some 50 miles from Galena. William Durley is killed, and the remaining five men escape and ride back to Galena with word of the ambush. Colonel James Strode, commanding the 27th Regiment of Illinois Militia, declares martial law and orders a fort built in Galena. On May 20th, eight new companies of militia were organized in the Mineral District. After a period of ten days, Fort Blue Mounds was finally completed. All the settlements were forted or abandoned. 
leaving a no-man's land in present-day southwestern Wisconsin and northern Illinois. Speaking from his own recollections 51 years afterwards, Augustus C. Dodge said, Fathers were frequently called to defend their own thresholds, and mothers and sisters molded bullets and carried water, filling barrels in order to have a supply during an anticipated siege. My mother and sisters have done both. The cows were milked, and God was worshipped under the surveillance of armed men. Christina Dodge, wife of Henry Dodge, was asked if she wanted to go to Galena for safety, but responded, My husband and sons are between me and the Indians. I am safe so long as they live. Yet forts can do nothing if white people were caught outside of them by the British band and their sympathizers. On May 21st, a massacre of white families outside of modern-day Idaho, Illinois, usually referred to as the Indian Creek Massacre, took place. Only two teenagers, Rachel and Sylvia Hall, survived. Their ordeal immediately caught the attention of the nation. For centuries, Indian captivity accounts both terrified and fascinated the American public. Viewed from a distance, this genre was mostly entertainment, but for those living on the frontier, captivity by Native Americans was feared worse than death. Rachel Hall, then 18 at the time, later recorded her experience. At about four o'clock in the afternoon, our family was assembled at the house of William Davis in Indian Creek. A large party of Indians, about 70 in number, were seen eight or ten paces from the house. As they approached, Mr. Pettigrew attempted to shut the door, but was shot down. The savages then rushed in. I got immediately upon the bed and stood there. The confusion was such, the terror inspired by the firing of guns in the house, the shrieks of the wounded and dying so great that I can't remember how each person was killed. The Indians massacred everyone, fifteen in all, including six children. Only my sister Sylvia and I were spared. As soon as the massacre was over, three Indians seized and dragged me from the bed without much violence and led me into the yard. I was then taken across the creek, from thence in front of the house where I saw my sister for the first time. We were then taken by four Indians, one holding on to each side of us, on foot as fast as we could run for two miles through timber until we came to a place where the Indians had left their horses. We were then placed, without constraint, on two of the poorest horses and proceeded as fast as we could until about midnight. The Indians exhibited, all the while, symptoms of great uneasiness, apparently apprehensive of being pursued. The Hall girls, in their fear and shock, had little appetite, but when the Indians gave them acorns to eat, they ate them lest they angered their captors. Yet what Rachel observed next would certainly make anyone have an uneasy stomach. The Indians, after having finished their scanty meal, busied themselves in dressing the scalps they had taken, stretching them upon small hoops. Among them I recognized by the color of the hair my own mother's. I fell into a swoon from which I was awakened by a summons to set out upon our journey. While the Hall sisters were at first afraid of being killed, the kindness and welcome shown to them by the women of the British band camp eased their fears. Although they no longer feared death, they were forced to participate in a sock dance by having their faces painted and were forced to lie down on their faces on the ground. Yet the Halls were far from the last victims. On May 23rd, Adam Payne, a traveling minister, is chased on horseback for miles until he is finally shot down and murdered. On May 24th, Indian agent Felix St. Vrain and five others were traveling from Dixon's Ferry with orders from General Atkinson. As they finished eating breakfast, about 30 warriors, probably Winnebago, approached. The men retreated, but four were shot and killed. An account of the massacre from George W. Jones, who was St. Vrain's brother-in-law and the man who identified his body, said the warriors had scalped the dead men, but also cut off the hands, head, and feet and removed St. Vrain's heart. They reportedly passed around pieces of the heart for the braves to eat. At least one source indicated that mutilation began before St. Vrain was dead. To the settlers and militia, it seemed as if news of defeats and massacres came every single day. 
For them, this war was extremely personal. The threat to women and children who in Western culture were assumed to be non-combatants was especially terrifying and infuriating at the same time. As Wakefield reflected on these events just a year later, the emotions were still raw. The Indians commenced their well-known practice of warfare. They went about the 20th of May to the houses of Mr. Hall, Davies, and Pennegrew, and there killed 15 men, women, and children, and scalped them all. But even this was not enough to satisfy the bloodthirsty demons. They mutilated them in the most inhuman and indecent manner that was ever witnessed. It was enough to make the blood chill in a person's veins, to know how these merciless hellhounds served those who were not in the slightest degree able to help themselves. After every indecency that could be practiced on their persons, the women were hung up by their feet, the helpless children literally chopped to pieces, the houses were burned, the furniture all destroyed, the stock killed, and even the barnyard fowls. The work of destruction and devastation had now begun. The blood of helpless women and children had been spilt. Two young and beautiful women were taken prisoners by these monsters in human shape. They were become an easy prey to these barbarians. For men like Henry Dodge, such passions compel him to act to protect the frontier. On May 25th, Dodge and Henry Gratchett, accompanied by two companies of mounted volunteers, hold a council with the Winnebago at the village of White Crow on the head of Lake Mendota. To keep the neighboring Winnebagos from joining Black Hawk was a matter of high importance. Colonel Dodge addressed the Winnebago, many of whom he was personally acquainted with. Interestingly enough, he uses the primary source of friction between the miners and the Indians as a symbol of the two people's friendship instead of a cause for war. Dodge stated, My friends, Mr. Gratchett, your father, and myself have met to talk with you. Having identified us both as your friends in making the sale of your country to the United States, you will not suspect us of deceiving you. The Sacks have shed the blood of our people. The Winnebago Prophet, and, as, as we are told, one hundred of your people have united with Black Hawk and his party. Our people are anxious to know in what relation you stand to us, whether as friends or enemies. Your residence being near our settlements, it is necessary and proper that we should explicitly understand from you, the chiefs and warriors, whether you intend to aid, harbor, or conceal the Sacks in your country. To do so will be considered as a declaration of war on your part. Your great father is the friend of the Redskins. He wishes to make you happy. Your chiefs who have visited Washington know him well. He is mild in peace, but terrible in war. He will ask of no people what is not right, and he will submit to nothing wrong. His power is great. He commands all the warriors of the American people. If you strike us, you will strike him, and to make war on us, you will have your country taken from you. Your annuity money will be forfeited, and the lives of your people must be lost. We speak the words of truth. We hope they will sink deep into your hearts. We hope, however, the bright chain of friendship will still continue, though we may travel the same road in friendship under a clear sky. We have always been your friends. We have said you will be honest and true to your treaties. Do not let your actions deceive us. So long as you are true and faithful, we will extend the hand of friendship to you and to your children. If unfaithful, you must expect to share the fate of the Sacks. Although Dodge was a leading figure in the mining industry and considered by some at times to be a squatter, Dodge generally had a good reputation with the Winnebago. When Spoon de Cora met Dodge, he already had a favorable opinion. Spoon de Cora later recalled, My father knew General Dodge very well, and he always claimed him as a brother in talking with him, which was a great honor. But General Dodge was a good friend to our people, and deserved to be well treated by them. This relationship between the leaderships of both whites and Indians did much to prevent the loss of life. The Winnebagos, today known as the Ho-Chunk, were divided as to which course to take in the war. The Rock River Winnebago, being more likely to be intermarried with the Sauk, were generally much more eager to assist the British band with supplies and guides. However, the Wisconsin River Winnebago were split evenly between those who wanted to fight for the Americans and those who wanted to join the British band. Some, like the Decorah family, as seen in this 1830 painting by George Catlin, had personal reasons to be enemies of the Fox and Sauk. 
In 1829, Wakanda Cora's daughter, who had married a Dakota man, was killed in Iowa by Sauk and Meswaki raiders, part of ongoing hostilities between Dakotas and the Sauks and Meswakis. Decorah wanted to mount a retaliatory raid against the Sox and Meswakis, but was discouraged by from doing this by the United States officials, who were trying to negotiate an end to the hostilities. Just three years later, animosity toward the Sox was still intense. Spoon Decorah later recalled, When we heard of the trouble, I wanted very much to go and join the Americans. I knew the officers at Fort Winnebago and was friendly to them, but my friends around me said the Sox were friends of the Winnebagoes so I was persuaded not to go. Tribal cohesion and self-restraint in matters of personal revenge probably prevented disaster for the Winnebago. The Winnebago generally will seek to please both parties while staying out of the way. Perhaps being told what they wanted to hear, Dodge and Gratchett received profuse assurances that the Winnebago will be loyal to the American cause. Satisfied, Dodge returns to his home at Fort Union. Meanwhile, Black Hawk had since decided to move up the Rock River. On May 28th, he reaches Lake Koshkonong. Black Hawk sends out two 200-man war parties from the British band to the southwest to distract the army and disrupt the frontier. That same day, most of Whitside's brigade disbands in disgust. They had been in service for over a month and have accomplished nothing but one humiliating defeat. Lincoln and 300 men still remained to serve. The next day, Edward Beauchard, sub-agent under Henry Gratchett, meets with Wakan Hawkaw and other Winnebago on the eastern prominence of Blue Mounds to negotiate a release for the Hall Girls. But Beauchard then hears frightening news that the two 200-man sock war parties will target Blue Mounds. Next day, inspired by Atkinson's offer relayed through Beauchard of $2,000 to the release of the Hull sisters, White Crow leads a party of a dozen Winnebagoes to the camp of the British band. He negotiates the release of the Hull sisters and starts north towards the Mound Fort. Although General Atkinson had offered $2,000 for the girls, the ransom paid to the sock by the Winnebago is only ten ponies plus some tobacco and corn and other gifts. Yet for Sylvia and Rachel Hall their ordeal may be over, but they still are apprehensive. They weren't quite sure they could believe the Winnebago chiefs. They had feared that they were being taken further and further into the wilderness and away from civilization and their home. The violence and terror had begun, but how will it end? If you enjoyed this video, please like it and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.